My name is Josh Sokol, and I'm the creator and CEO of Simple Risk. Today, I'm going to walk you through our platform for governance, risk management, and compliance. I'm excited to show you the various features and functionality that make it one of the best GRC options available today. Not just because we start free and offer our paid functionality at a lower price point than any of our competitors, but also because we give you a comparable level of functionality that is infinitely more intuitive to use. After all, the first six letters of our name are simple. Before we get started though, I'd like to share with you a bit about my background. I was running the information security program for a very large $1.6 billion a year publicly traded company when my VP came up to me one day and she said she heard about risk management and wanted me to look into it for her. I did a lot of research. I came across the NIST 800-30 framework and I said that this is what I want my program to look like, but the piece that I really struggled with was the tool set. I started off using Excel spreadsheets, very quickly realized that those weren't gonna scale for me. I actually used a Lowe's notes database for a little bit, custom built, but it just wasn't dynamic enough. And then I started looking at the big GRC suites that were out there, the archers and the CAs of the world. I found one that I really liked. I ended up sitting down with my VP. I told her, hey, you asked me to look into this risk management thing. Here's what I learned. And here's the tool that I need to do my job. I put a quote on our desk for about half a million dollars and she laughed at me. She said, Josh, your budget is zero dollars, go figure it out. And so I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. The Excel spreadsheets that I was using weren't gonna scale. I realized that I couldn't afford a big GRC tool. And so I decided to do something about it. I wrote a tool that I ended up calling Simple Risk. I gave a talk at the B-Sides Austin conference back in March of 2013. I talked about risk management and what I had learned through this process I always hate it when people go to these security conferences, they get up on their soapboxes and they talk about all the problems with our industry and then they mic drop and walk away. I wanted to leave them with a solution. And so I took this tool that I wrote that I was using it for my risk management program and I released it free and open source to the community. I called it Simporus. And it turns out that other people have this problem as well. People started coming to me and saying, hey Josh, can we pay you for support? Can you host it for us? Can you make it integrate with Active Directory, make it send emails, perform risk assessments? And so the business of Simporus grew out of that free and open source product. Today, we still have that free and open source product. We call it the Simporus Core, and is the basis for all of our Simporus installations around the world. The Simporus Core has all the fundamental governance, risk management, and compliance capabilities so that everybody out there can do better than spreadsheets. On top of that, we have what we call Simporus Extras. Extras are plug and play modules that give you additional features and functionality that go above and beyond the Simporus core. We have two different deployment models at Simporus. We have Simporus On-Prem, which allows you to run Simporus in your data center, in your environment. And we have Simporus Hosted, which is hosted in the Amazon data center using best practices in order to host our Simporus instances. The big benefit to hosting is that you are no longer responsible for things like backups, monitoring, upgrades. You get to focus your time and attention on managing risk rather than managing a platform to manage risk. What you see here is a, the first page that you're gonna see when you log into a Simporus instance. This was designed to be kind of a stoplight view into your risk management posture, where red is bad or at least an action that needs to be taken, and green is good or an action that has been taken. So immediately upon logging in, you know how many open versus closed risks you have, mitigations planned versus unplanned, and risk reviewed versus unreviewed. All of these charts are clickable. If you click them, they will bring you into our dynamic risk report. We'll talk about that more later, but for now it's kind of a tabular view of the data that sits underneath it. It allows you to group, filter, and sort in different ways. Along the bottom, you're gonna see a 13 month window of risk in your environment. How many risks were opened, how many were closed, that trend or the difference between them, and then the total number of open risks. So again, very quickly when logging into your instance, you know, am I doing better this month than it was last month or this year than it was at this time last year? In terms of risk management, this is based on that NIST 800-30 framework that I mentioned earlier. NIST says that you should submit your risks and keep a registry of all the risks in your environment. It talks about planning mitigations for those risks and what are we gonna to do to fix this particular issue? talks about management being involved in the process through performing reviews, and it talks about risk management being a cyclical process, 
you don't just do it once and forget about it. You make sure that you are re-reviewing risk on a regular basis. So you'll note numbers one, two, three, and five reflect that process. In terms of submitting a risk, the only field that's actually required here is the subject field. And I did this intentionally because in my risk management program, when I first started, I was a team of one. And I realized very quickly that I would not scale. I had to get everybody else in my organization involved in this process if I was going to be successful. And so I always picture this one Unix admin working on a system. He comes across an unencrypted SSH key. And in that moment, he has a decision to make. Do I stop what I'm doing, pivot, submit a risk, and then go back to what I was doing? Or do I just keep on working on my system, doing my job, and I'll just remember to submit that risk later? The reality is, is that if he says that latter, if he says, I'll just submit it later, he has so much on his mind and so much on his plate that the likelihood of him actually doing that is pretty low. Meanwhile, my organization just missed out on the opportunity to capture that risk. So instead, we want to make this as simple a process as possible to further incentivize him to actually submit that risk when he comes across it. So that administrator can come in here and type something like unencrypted SSH key on server X, hit submit, and go right back on to what he was doing. Now, if he knows the values for these other fields, he certainly can populate those values, but he doesn't have to. We can take a look later on. I can schedule a follow-up meeting with him if I'm not sure of these values, and we can adjust these. Now, looking at this, we see server X. Server X is an asset. And so we can look at our list of affected assets. We can search that for our server X, and we can select it from the list. This is going to tie our risk to that asset. And we'll talk more about the benefits of doing that later. Once that Unix admin submits the risk, we can modify additional details, such as the subject. Maybe we want to change this to something more like breach of data confidentiality due to an unencrypted SSH key. And we can remove the on server X because we've already know that in our affected assets. We can add high level risk mappings and map our risk into these high level categories. Simforest has a number of these by default, but you can always add your own. You can add things like sites or locations, teams, technologies, add additional stakeholders, define owners and managers. We support six different risk scoring methodologies in Simforest. Classic is what you'd find on your CISSP, risk is likelihood times impact, but we also support weighted likelihood, weighted impact, and custom risk matrices. You have CVSS, which you find on CVEs. Dread is the old school Microsoft risk rate methodology. OWASP is great for application security risk. Custom says just give me a zero through 10 value. In contributing risk, we have a big data center customer out in the UK and did a custom development effort for them to introduce their scoring methodology into simple risk. It uses a single likelihood value spread across multiple weighted impact values. The cool thing though, is that every organization has the benefit of being able to use that methodology. So as an example, we have a large hospital organization on the East Coast of the US who's also using the contributing risk scoring methodology. On top of that, every single one of our scoring methodologies is based on a zero through 10 scale. So the benefit here is that you could score a SQL injection vulnerability using OWASP and the latest blue keep vulnerability with CVSS, and they're all gonna be based on that same scale. You can add a risk assessment and additional notes, attach your supporting documentation. And this field right here actually comes from our customization extra. So anytime you look at Simforce and say, I really wish there was a, a field to track a certain value, or I want to remove that field, or I just wanna change the order of those fields. That's where our customization comes in. You can also add tags to Simforest. Each risk can have a main-to-main -main relationship between risks and tags, and you can filter, sort, and group based on those tags in the dynamic risk report. Now, once you've submitted the risk, the next step would be to plan a mitigation for that risk. And this page will show you every risk that does not have a mitigation plan for it yet, ordered by the highest inherent risk score on down. So simply start at the top and click on no. This will bring us to the page to plan the mitigation for this risk. We can see our inherent risk score and our residual risk score located at the top. This is a tab-based infrastructure, so we can look back at the details or the review. In terms of the mitigation, we can set our planning date, define our strategy, set how much effort is involved. We could set a cost or an owner or a team, and we can even define our mitigation percentage, which will be used in a moment 
to apply to our inherent risk score and give us an updated residual risk. You can also select controls from our governance section. So if, for example, I want to search for a control that has to do with encrypting data at rest, I simply search for that word, select the control, and it will now tie that control to this risk. You can add solutions, requirements, and recommendations, add additional supporting documentation here as well. And at the bottom, you can add comments to this risk, have conversations about it, and each risk will keep its own audit trail of everything that's happened. Now, as I mentioned, I am applying a 50% mitigation to my risk. My inherent risk score is 10, so when I hit save mitigation, my residual risk updates and it's now a five or a medium level risk. And we can actually see how these risks are changing over the course of time in this chart right here. We can see that my inherent risk score was a 10 and is still a 10, but my residual risk has now dropped to a five. And as you go and as you update your inherent risk score or your residual risk score, this risk scoring history chart will change to reflect that. In terms of performing reviews, this view looks very similar to plan mitigation, but the big difference here is it is showing us a list of every risk that does not have a management review performed for it yet, still ordered by the highest inherent risk on down. So we simply start at the top and click on no. This will bring us to the page to perform the review. What is our review? Do we want to approve this risk or do we want to reject it and close it? If we approve the risk, what's our next step? Do we accept until next review, kick the can down the road? Do we consider this for a project, in which case we can select from an existing project or create a new one? Or do we submit this as a production issue and leverage an external system for that process? We're gonna go ahead and accept this until next review. We could add a comment. And then based on the risk score, we're automatically gonna calculate the next review date. This is configurable. If you go to the configure menu and then configure review settings, you can set how often you review risks of different risk levels. So right now I'm looking at very high level risk, which means that we're gonna review it every 90 days. So 90 days from today, we're gonna to set the next review date. You can override this if you want to and set a different date, but for now we're just gonna accept the default. When I hit submit, it's gonna save this review. Now, the one thing that I want you to note is this was risk 1213. And if I go back to perform reviews, this was at the very top of the list, but now it's no longer there. So you can consider the plan mitigation and perform reviews menus kind of like a checklist. As you go through, as you take action, those items will be checked off the list and it'll be the next items that go up to the top. For the sake of time, I'm gonna skip over plan projects, but just understand that this gives you the ability to lump multiple risks into a project, which gives you two additional capabilities. One is reporting. You can report on all the risks that are associated with a given project. Number two is some batch management. You can basically take a project, drag it into a completed bucket, and that will mark every risk that's associated with that project as closed. Lastly, we have review regularly. This is gonna show us a list of every single risk in our system. So this is essentially our risk registry. It's gonna show it ordered by next review date, followed by the inherent risk score. So what we'll find is that all of the unreviewed risks, those new risks in our environment, are gonna bubble up to the top so that they are reviewed first. Then we're gonna see everything that's past due. These are risks that were reviewed at one point in time, but are now past their due date and are required to re-review. Lastly, we're gonna see all the risks that are due at some point in the future. So general best practice would be to establish a monthly cadence, where at the beginning of the month, you go ahead and you review all the risks that are gonna come due for that month. Then you review anything that's unreviewed. Those are the new risks that have been submitted into the system. And you review anything that's past due. Those are the risks that have just lapsed since your last review section. And if you do that, all of the risks in your environment should show with future dates at the beginning of each month. Now that we've talked about risk management, let's talk about governance. Governance in Symphorus starts with defining your frameworks and controls. Now there's multiple different ways that you can get frameworks and controls into Simple Risk. First, you can add them manually. You can click the plus button, add a new framework, go to the controls tab, click the plus button and add your controls and then tie your controls back to the framework. Now, obviously that's a lot of work. We don't wanna all have to do that. So we have some other options as well. The first one is you can go to configure and content and using our import export extra, which is one of those paid modules, 
you have the ability to one click install a variety of different frameworks. These are common frameworks like the SOC 2, the critical security controls, CMMC, uh, things like the NIST cybersecurity framework. And so one click to install and you will then find those frameworks under the frameworks list in Simports. The other option that we have for you is to use an import capability. So you can go to configure and import exports, again, using the import export extra, select import controls from the list, select a CSV file containing your list of controls, and then click on import. And Simporis will ask you to map the columns in your spreadsheet to the fields in Simporis, and then import those controls into the system. The final option that I have for you is you can go to configure and extras. And if you have registered your Simporis instance, you will have access to something we call the Compliance Forge Secure Controls Framework Extra. So with this, if I click on yes, I'm given a list of 143 different frameworks. Now these frameworks are each mapped to a set of common controls. And there are over 900 controls in the Compliance Forge Secure Controls Framework. The major benefit of this approach is that you only have to have those controls once and they apply across all of these different frameworks. So currently I have my controls applying to the CIS critical security controls, GDPR, ISO 27001, NIST cybersecurity framework, et cetera. And I have one set of controls across all of those. So from a testing perspective, I test it once and it applies in all those situations. The one major drawback to this approach is that this does not use the actual verbiage from those actual controls. So let's take a look at a quick example. If I go to controls and I say, I wanna look at my ISO 27001 framework, this is gonna update and show us only the controls that are associated with that framework. Now we can see this control, this GOVA1 control comes from Compliance Forge. We can see the actual information about this control in Compliance Forge, and we can see the mappings to the other frameworks. So we can see GOVA1 in Compliance Forge maps to ISO 27001 5.1, which is also SOC 2 CC 1.2, which is also PCI 3.2, 12.1. Uh, so it makes it very easy for us to track these controls because we have a single control that applies to all of these different frameworks. And from a testing standpoint, that saves us time, which ultimately saves us money. Once we've defined our controls and frameworks, we can also add documentation. We can create our policies, our guidelines, our standards and our procedures and upload them into Simporis. This functionality integrates with our uh, email notification extra, so you can receive emails when your policies are coming due for a review. We also do a little bit of version control where we will keep a past version of your documentation in the system after you upload a new version. You can lastly define exceptions. So for each of your policies, each of your controls, if you ever have auditors that come in, the first thing they do is they ask for a copy of your policies. Then the next thing they do is look at all of your systems and try and figure out where you're not following your policies. Now, if they find anywhere, that becomes a finding on your audit report. However, if you can demonstrate that you were aware of those issues and that management had approved of those issues in advance, now you have an exception and there is no longer a finding on your audit report. So Simporis will track those exceptions. In addition to tracking those exceptions, we'll send emails to the approvers when it is coming due for another review. So you can ensure that all of your exceptions are being reviewed on a regular basis. Next, we have compliance. With compliance in Simporis, we can select from any of our different control frameworks. For each of the controls in these different frameworks, we can define as many tests as we would like. So for example, I have a control here that says physical devices and systems within the organization are inventory. And for this particular control, I have two different tests that I've created. I have a test for on-premise devices, and I have a test for cloud devices. This is because each of these might be tested in different ways. And we can see here that the last time this one was tested was on May 26th, but the last time this one was tested was on May 24th. So let's run our cloud assets test again. In order to run a test, we just go to initiate audits. Initiate audits is going to show us a list of every single one of our frameworks that have tests defined for them. And we can expand it and see the controls and expand it again and see each of the individual tests. And we can initiate an audit either at the framework level, at the control level, or at the individual test level. So let's go ahead and kick off this test for cloud assets. 
just like that, we've initiated our new test. That's based on the template that we defined in the defined test step. We can go to active audits and we'll see our audit right here. Right now our status is empty, so let's update that. Let's change our audit status. Let's set our audit status right now to pending evidence from the control owner and our result to inconclusive. Hit submit. Now, if we go back to our active audits list, we'll note that our status changed. In my program, I was responsible for SOX audit for a period of about six years. And one of the things that I really struggled with was knowing what's weighing on me versus what I'm weighing on somebody else for. But this makes it incredibly easy. I just go up to status and to see the list of things that I'm weighing on somebody else on, I just select pending evidence from the control owner. If I wanna see things that are weighing on me, I select evidence submitted pending review. You can also filter by other values such as the tester or even just by text. Eventually, this is gonna become uh, evidence submitted pending review, then it'll pass QA or require some internal remediation. And lastly, it'll move to close, at which point we can give it a result we can add additional comments if we want to. We can attach all of our evidence to this and hit submit. And once we do this, it is no longer an active audit. So it will disappear from that view. But we'll be able to see it in the past audits list. We can reopen if we need to. We can look at the details of this particular audit and see all the information here. We can see an audit trail of everything that happened with this particular test, any comments that were added, all the attachments that were added into here. It makes it very simple for us to be able to capture the information associated with our compliance and validate that our controls are operating effectively. In terms of assets, you can add assets into Simplerisk in a wide variety of ways. You can do an automated discovery, which is a very basic ping sweep in as lookup. You can manually add your assets into the system. You can use our import export functionality to import assets from a CSV file. You can also use the import export extra via the integration with Tamble.io or Rapid7 Expos to pull those assets in. And lastly, you can use our API. Once you have the assets in here, you can define valuations. So you can set a value for a given asset and you can also manage asset groups. So you can create groups that contain multiple assets inside of them. The major benefit to being able to use asset valuation is that we can use that as a means to move from qualitative to quantitative risk assessment. Under our reporting, we can go to our risks and assets report. And this will show us a list of each asset and all of the risks that's associated with it. This is a great way to identify assets that have a lot of risk and are candidates for patching or retirement. We can go up to the top and select assets by risk. And this will now show us a list of each risk and all of the assets associated with it. Now we can see that this particular risk is a very high level risk and it has a maximum quantitative loss of a million dollars worth associated with it. So that means if we add up the values across all the assets, we could potentially lose a million dollars. That's not particularly interesting for very high level risk, but let's say this was a low level risk with $10 million worth of loss associated with it. That might be compelling enough for us to actually change the impact score that was associated with that particular risk. We can also build assessments in Simplest, and this originally started as the easy button. I allowed customers who said, Josh, I really like how simple and intuitive this platform is, but I don't know where to get started. And so I built in some self-assessments into the platform, starting with the critical security controls. So a user could come in here and say, yes, I do that. No, I don't do that. Yes, I do that. Scroll down to the bottom and hit submit. And the end result is a pending risk that's valid based on their answers that they can then choose whether or not to add into the system. Now, what happened was we had a big university on the East Coast, close to the US, who came to us and said, I would like to be able to do internal risk assessments for all of the teams that are operating internally, doing custom development and so on. Around that same time, we had a big manufacturing company come to us and say, we want to be able to do third party vendor risk assessments. So we got them together and we created what's now our risk assessment extra. With the risk assessment extra, you can create contacts contacts are users you're going to send an assessment to, but that don't have access into your simple system. From here, we can create questions and questions come in two different types. We can do a fill in the blank question where we ask an open ended question and get an open ended answer back or multiple choice and things get really interesting with multiple choice. We can ask a question 
we can provide the answers that they can answer to. And for each one, we can choose whether to submit a risk, fail a compliance, or define a level of maturity. So let's look at this example. This example says, are access permissions and authorizations managed incorporating the principles of least privilege and separation of duties? And we've actually mapped this to a given control, which is PRAC-4. Now, if we look down here, we have a yes answer. And some of my answers is yes, we don't want to do anything. There's no follow-up steps, nothing failed. But if they say no, we're going to go ahead and create a new risk. We can see that here. We've got risk subject. We've got the risk scoring. We can define assets that are affected, tags, and tie this back to specific mitigating controls. We also have a compliance assessment. And we say, if they answer no, we're going to fail that control. And lastly, we can add a maturity assessment. Now, this wasn't initially selected for this, but you can say, if they answer no, then the control maturity is not performed. And we can actually evaluate the entire uh, assessment against our maturity desired levels. Now, once we've created our questions, we can assemble them into a template. A template is just a list of questions we want to ask and the order that we want to ask them in. We also have the ability to dynamically create a questionnaire. So if you click yes here, this will bring you to a page where you can select from any of the compliance board's frameworks. For example, let's take our ISO 27001 framework. This will show us each control that's associated with that framework. And we can generate either a standard questionnaire, which is going to give us answers of yes, no, or not applicable, or a maturity questionnaire, which is going to give us each of the different maturity levels for the given control and adjust the resulting risk accordingly. Once we've created our templates, we can create questionnaires. These are the templates that we want to use and who we want to send them to. This will send an email. They'll click the link, populate the assessment, and you will see the results. So let's take a look at the assessment that I ran here. We can see the questionnaire. We can see each question that was asked, all of the answers that were presented, along with the selected answer highlighted in bold. At the top, we can see that this was a risk assessment. And we can see all the risks that were created, in this case, three, with a cumulative score of 19 and an average score of 6.33. These are all currently pending risks, so we can see them here, and we can choose to add them into our system. We can also see that a compliance assessment was done. And here we can see each of the controls that was tested and our pass-fail status against those controls. Lastly, this could be a maturity assessment. In this case, we can see our current level of maturity based on the assessment as well as the desired level of maturity based on what we selected for our given control. And along the bottom, we can see each control that was part of this assessment. And in pink, if this was underperforming, and in green, if it met or exceeded our desired level of control maturity. You can compare results over time, and you can even share results when you're done with it with the people who took the assessment. We also have some risk analysis capabilities so you can take an assessment by company or questionnaire and see a list of all risks that were associated with that company. We have lots of reporting options in Simplex. We talked about this one, but we also have a risk dashboard if you like create pie charts. In Simplex, you can also define uh, your level of appetite. So there is a slider here at the bottom of the configure menu that allows you to change that level of appetite. And that is going to impact your risk appetite report. So you can see here, the amount of residual risk and the inherent risk. And anything that has a residual risk that's less than your level of appetite is going to show up in within appetite. These are things that have been mitigated to an acceptable level. Anything outside of your appetite will show up here. And these are things that still require effort. You can see your risk trends. So you can see how your risk is changing over the course of time. Our dynamic risk report allows you to choose which columns are going to show up and then filter based on different values. So if I want to see a list of every risk that has the word attack with an inherent risk and a residual risk greater than five, I simply enter those values and the report will update to show them to me. Then if I want to save this report and run it later, I can define whether this is a public report so that all my users can see it or a private report so only I can see it, give it a name, and then I can pull that report up later just by selecting it from the saved selections. We have a connectivity visualizer in Simporis which gives you the ability to view risk based on risk, asset, control, or framework. So as an example, let's take our satellite asset. 
If I select that asset from my drop-down list, we can see the asset right here in green. We can see that there's only one risk associated with it. That's the gray one here. We can see that there are two controls that are associated with that risk. And we can see the multitude of frameworks that are associated with those controls. This makes it very simple to kind of pivot on different views and see exactly what that looks like in your system. We've got views for risk average over time. We've got heat maps for likely an impact. So you can see where your risks sit on the different vertices. We'll even give you risk advice and tell you, you told us this is a trivial amount of effort to fix, but it's a 10 risk score. That's your low hanging fruit. Go tackle that for the biggest bang for your buck. We talked about risks and assets. We also have a report of risks and controls. So you can see each control and all the risks that's associated with it, or flip it over and see each risk and all the controls that are associated with it. A couple of other reports that are worth highlighting here. One, your audit timeline report. This will show you a list of all of the controls that you need to do testing on. It'll show you the last time it was tested, the result of that test, and the next time it is due. And you can initiate audits, view active audits, or past audits directly from here. If you've defined your controls in your governance piece, you can define the current control maturity and the desired control maturity. And this has one other report that's associated with it, which is our control gap analysis report. With control gap analysis, you can select from any of the frameworks and it will show you the level of maturity across the different families that are associated with that framework. So in this example, I'm doing quite well with respect to asset management, but I am not doing very well with respect to secure engineering and architecture. Along the bottom, we can see each control that's below maturity, at maturity, or above maturity, helping us to focus on the things that really need the most effort. Obviously, Simplest is highly configurable. You can change just about any of the settings in Simplest. You can even use other languages in Simplest by selecting them from the menu. We have a content catalog of frameworks and assessments. We have a risk and threat catalog built into the system. You can modify the risk formula and change the colors or the names of the different levels. And of course, we have very fine grained access control. So for each user, you can define what they're able to do within the system and even bubble that up into roles. Lastly, we have an audit trail in the system that handles every single activity and will show you what's going on and who did what and when. In terms of Simplest Extras, these are the paid for functionalities in the system. This starts with advanced search, which gives you the ability to click up here, search for a keyword, and have everywhere that keyword shows in a risk show up in the system, making it very easy to search for certain information. We have an API extra that provides REST-based API with JSON results returned. So you can programmatically interface Simplest with other systems in your organization. The Compliance Forge SCF extra I mentioned earlier, that one is free, but gives you the ability to select from those 143 different frameworks. Custom authentication gives you the ability to integrate with Active Directory for authentication or SAML or another single sign-on provider, as well as Duo for multi-factor authentication. Customization gives you the ability to create your own custom fields in Simplest, to remove existing fields or change the order. By default, MySQL databases are clear text, so encrypted database adds AES 256-bit encryption on top of that. Import-export gives you the ability to import from CSV files, export from CSV files, and also includes the integrations with Tenable.io and Rapid7 Expos. With incident management, we actually have a full incident management system built on top of Simplest. So you can go to slash incidents in Simplest and see the steps to prepare for an incident. You can identify the incident, assign the incident, prioritize it using the NIST framework, define locations, and add associations for this incident. So you can relate an incident to other incidents, to risks, and to assets. In terms of incident response, we give you nine different playbooks to start with in Simplest, but you can create your own playbooks as well. You can define the steps for containment, eradication, and recovery for this particular type of incident. You can also add your own evidence and add notes into the system. You can define lessons learned for a given incident, and then we have reporting for each of our different incidents. So if I go back here and I select this, we're going to see the direction for the incident, the number of incidents per day, our different attack vectors, the sources of these incidents, and then the closure summary. 
which is a report I use quite a bit in my program because this tells us which tools are doing a really effective job and which ones not so much. The ones that are doing an effective job, those are ones that we want to invest more in. The ones not so much, we probably want to kick those to the curb. We have a JIRA Extra, which provides two-way integration between Symphorus and a JIRA system. Email Notification Extra, this gives you action-based notifications. So when actions are taken within the system, you'll receive emails for those. We also have uh, scheduled notifications, which are effectively reports that will send to you on a recurring basis with information like unreviewed and past due risks, audits coming due for review, unplanned mitigations, and so on. Risk assessments is the piece that we talked about where you can create questionnaires. You can perform risk, compliance, or maturity assessments and capture those results in the system. By default, all users see all risks in Simplis, but team-based separation adds silos. So the Unix team only sees Unix risks, the network team only sees network risks. Organizational hierarchy adds another layer of business unit above the teams. So you can have an HR organization, a legal organization, an IT organization, and they don't see the risks, they don't see the teams, and they don't see the users of the other organizations in the system. Lastly, we have the Unified Compliance Framework. Unified Compliance Framework is API level integration with UCF. Now, I'm sure at this point, you're wondering how much does it cost? And unlike our competitors, Simporus is very transparent when it comes to our pricing. You can go to simporus.com, our website, click on quote in the top corner, and you will see a list of each of the different options available to you. Simporus Core is free. It's open source, you can download it today and immediately be doing better than spreadsheets. Simforce on-premise is the one that you run in your data center, in your environment, on your servers. And Simforce hosted is in our data center, which means that we handle all the backups, the monitoring and the upgrades for you. Now pricing is gonna be about the same between these two. If you look, the high end of each of these is exactly the same. The big difference is with on-premise, you're gonna be able to choose which extras you have, whereas with hosted, we have very specific packages that you can select from. With respect to on-premise, you have three packages that are available or the option to customize. And you can see the different options, the different extras that are available in each of these packages. So in the basic package, you have team-based separation, email notification, and import export. With the plus package, we add in custom authentication and risk assessment. And with the premium package, we add in all the other extras with the exception of incident management, which is an additional $9,995 a year and organizational hierarchy, which is $2,995 per year per business unit with the first business unit being free. It's important to note that all of these packages include quarterly ask the expert calls, which give you an opportunity to discuss things that are working well, things that aren't working right and so on with me. They also include silver support. So if you run into any issues, you can reach out to our support team and they'll help you through. With respect to the large enterprise platform, that's broken up into three packages as well. So you can see our small enterprise is available for only $4,995 per year. That includes email notification, import export, and risk assessments. From there, we have our medium enterprise, which is $9,995 a year. That includes the team-based separation extra. And lastly, we have our large enterprise, which is $19,995 per year and includes all the other extras with incident management and organizational hierarchy additionally being extra. On behalf of all of us here at Simperus, I want to express our appreciation for you taking the time today to watch this video. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at support at .com. And before I say goodbye, I want to mention that we also have a free 30 day, no obligation trial of all of our Simforce extras in our hosted environment. We hope that you'll give us a try so that we can show you how to go from zero to GRC in minutes. We look forward to hearing from you soon.